Nathan Albach, and welcome to the podcast where we get into people's stories and go down a bunch of rabbit holes about what's really good in the world. So uh, last episode, I said I'd get back in a rhythm with releasing new episodes, and I guess I totally lied. <laughs> Work has just been really crazy lately, and I haven't been making the time to edit nearly as much as I need to, so sorry about that. I'm still a little behind, but I promise I'll be back on track soon. Um, I've been actually getting more into writing some material on LinkedIn lately, so big thanks to everyone who's given me feedback on my first two articles, the uh, first about brands breaking down the fourth wall in advertising by becoming more integrated and human-like, and then this most recent one about about the history of online culture and memes. They were a blast to write, and I'm really hoping to keep doing them in some capacity. Anyway, though, uh, let's jump right into today's episode. I had the pleasure of talking with Brandon Robertson. Brandon is a pastor, blogger, and activist who's best known for his work within the LGBTQ community among evangelicals. And he's the author of a few books, with his latest release being True Inclusion, Creating Communities of Radical Embrace. In our conversation, he shared his story growing up and how much of his initial faith was shaped by the reform movement rooted around the Calvinist sect of Christianity via people like John Piper, Tim Keller, and Mark Driscoll, then how he grew away from that into more progressive frames of belief. He talked about how he was outed as bisexual while attending Moody Bible College, which caused all sorts of insane tension that I won't spoil here. Then, how over time, as his sexual identity was growing stronger, he realized that this was just the person he was meant to be, and that it was okay to be that way, despite what his previous faith community had told him. Uh, We also went through the idea of social justice and inclusion in the Christian faith as a whole, and how that definition is expanding in what it means for LGBTQ people in the faith. Uh, This was the first time Brandon and I had ever even talked, and he couldn't have been a more open and thoughtful person with not just his story, but his whole assessment of these really difficult and complex issues. So I was really grateful for the conversation, and I hope you all take something from it. Now let's get into what's really good. Brandon, thanks for coming on the podcast. It's so good to be here with you. Thanks for having me. All right, so there's a bunch of directions that we can take this thing, but I'm interested to hear a bit more about your background growing up just to help set the stage for people listening. So um, I guess, first off, what were the relationships in your family and community like growing up? And were there any like specific aha moments you had that sparked your interest in what you do now, like between spirituality and activism? Kind of, yeah. I mean, I grew up, um, and my parents are completely okay with me saying this, I grew up at a, what I would call a rednecky conservative uh, trailer park <laughs> in Maryland. Um, and and yeah, that was a it was a unique uh, environment to grow up in, um, and I ended up stumbling into a fundamentalist Baptist church when I was twelve, um, and had a conversion experience there. Um, encountered a a God that was loving and had a plan for my life and all of that good stuff. And I, as a young twelve year old, kind of gave my life to Christ, as we would have put it back then, um, and that kind of put me on this journey towards. One, delving deep into religion, something that I'd never really, um, up to up to that 12-year-old point, not really been interested in. My family's not religious, not didn't grow up around religious communities at all. Um, and the funny thing is, and the blessing, I think, is that even though I kind of jumped headfirst into kind of a fundamentalist worldview, which with it comes all sorts of activism um, around conservative, far-right issues, um, I also, because I didn't have a family to go back to that was as conservative as my church, I was always curious. I always felt free to explore and press boundaries a little bit. Mm. Um, And so at the same time that I was going to the Inner Harbor in Baltimore once a week and uh, street preaching against the gays and the uh, people having abortions and things like that, I was also um, 
being exposed and reading and exploring other kinds of Christianity. Um, and that's always kind of been my journey from that point forward. It was always this, at least for the next decade, uh, digging deep into a conservative evangelical framework, um, finding a lot of life there, but also realizing that God, spirit, whatever we want to call it, is much bigger than that particular movement. And that helped my own spirituality. It helped my own activism and it helped my own way of relating to other people. And it also caused me a lot of distress and uh, harm. And it's actually kind of forms the basis of all the ministry I do and this book, because both in my fundamentalist community and in the church I ended up afterwards um, and in my Bible college I ended up going to, I would press the boundaries, ask questions, fraternize with people that were considered outsiders. And the response in all of those communities to varying degrees was being threatened with exclusion, being threatened right. with uh, being forced out because I was somehow dangerous for fraternizing or asking questions or whatever. Uh, and that was traumatic for me because I was just trying to be faithful. I was just trying to ask honest questions and Honestly, as cheesy as it sometimes sounds, I was just trying to be like Jesus and hang out with people that were different than me. Um, and my communities consistently couldn't handle that and uh, re reacted to me with a great deal of fear um, and eventually vitriol in a number of ways. Um, so that curiosity, both spiritually and politically, um, has again, helped me continue to grow and evolve, and it's uh, got me excluded from a whole lot of places. Wow, that's so interesting, like, hearing how your curiosity sort of stemmed within this fundamentalist church. Like, how much of it do you think was sort of from the church versus your own temperament? Like, I know you're saying you had more space because your family wasn't as, uh, I guess, actively fundamentalist maybe is that, if that's yeah. the right word you know so it's like they weren't i guess pushing you to believe a certain thing so you had space to be curious but like where do you think you got that curiosity from initially that's a good question um i don't know that i actually have a good answer for where that curiosity comes from um i think a lot of it comes down to personality um but also i was i mean frankly just growing up i was kind of um an introverted loner type of a kid that spent a lot of time in my mind. Um, mm. And I, yeah, was just very curious and wanted to learn and wanted to question. And I also had in those early days, like so many people, um, when you first come to especially a more conservative Christian faith, there is some deep spiritual connection that you have. There's a deep emotional vibrancy to a new faith. Right. And I think my connection to whatever it was, God's spirit, whatever, um, was so, it just felt so dynamic that I, I didn't really care what my church was saying while I did want to, um, please my pastors. And, uh, because I wanted to be a pastor myself, I wanted to honor them and all of that good stuff. But I also just always felt like, Hey, if I, if I feel right with God, so to speak, um, then it doesn't really matter what other people are trying to say. This is like that's the most genuine sounding <laughs> faith story because it really does sound like this came from internally within you. Usually, I don't know, when, when I talk to a lot of people with this type of background, you get a lot of heavy influence. Well, I mean, one from the family it usually starts in the family. And then by the time people get through the whole church system, that feeling that you're talking about of wanting to please God, you know, wanting to spread ideas, be curious about your faith, like a lot of that is usually tapered with dogma. It's almost like, I guess, typically dogma comes first before all that. So that sort of feeds those interests maybe. And with you, it yeah. sounds like you were given that interest and that curiosity so that you've been like free flowing, able to kind of move through a lot of this without that baggage that a lot of us tend to have like from way earlier on. Totally. And I mean, yeah, I got my fair, fair share of baggage as I, uh, pressed forward, right? Like, so my fundamentalist Baptist church, really what ended up happening was I discovered a guy named Mark Griscoll on YouTube and oh uh, d discovered that you could cuss and have sex and dress in cool clothes and still be a fundamentalist. And so I followed uh, that path for a while and became 
a hardcore Calvinist at 13 and 14 years old and was going back and telling my youth group the stuff I was hearing Mark Driscoll say. Wow. And my Baptist church was strictly non reformed and basically said, hey, you're a heretic now and you're not welcome here. Um, and so that kind of experience of, again, I was just being intellectually honest with where I was at uh, and curious. And they responded with that line of thought is not welcome here. And so I I started picking up that dogma like I, very early on, but I also realized how faulty it was because, again, I mean, I knew how absurd it was that a church was telling a 13-year-old that he was a heretic and dangerous for listening to YouTube videos. Like, that was clearly crazy. (laughs) So, how did your position, or I should say just your views in general, evolve from that point to where you are now? Just, you don't have to get too deep into it, but I'm interested to hear, it's just really funny, maybe for those listening who don't know who Mark Driscoll is as much, like, it's interesting for me to hear how he was sort of a, a figure that you would mention within Calvinism who really sparked that sort of um, feeling within you to move in that direction when, I guess, when it comes to, like, who you are now and your beliefs and where, I don't even know where he is. Now, I haven't heard anything about him in years, but can yeah. you can sort of describe who he is and, you know, what your spiritual journey was like from that point on to me, like, the next few years? Totally. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, uh, Driscoll was a gateway drug for me, and I think for a lot of people, into a more progressive Christianity, which I know sounds crazy. But uh, at the time, um, in his early days, Driscoll was kind of part of the emergent church movement, a postmodern movement questioning kind of the core-held beliefs of evangelical Christianity. Mm -hmm. And he quickly got influenced by this neo-reform movement, this Calvinistic movement that really believed— I mean, he was hardcore, so he would believe that God chose a very select group of people to go to heaven and intentionally chose most of humanity to be damned to hell, and that them being damned to hell gave God glory. And um, along with that theology came a really hardcore patriarchal theology that, I mean, he got in a lot of controversy about four years ago for calling women penis homes and things like that, like this hardcore notion um, that women were just meant to submit to men. Um, And he became kind of a spearhead of a new movement, the neo-reform movement. And I think I got caught up in what so many young folks got caught up in. Um, He was as conservative as you could be. He was bringing this new kind of theology, which was this uh, reform theology that told you that you were chosen by God and nobody else was, basically, which is appealing in many ways. Yep. Um, And then from that point on, um, he also, like I said, was a cool guy. He wore cool clothes and had cool music in his church, and he talked about drinking and smoking and sex, all the things that uh, traditional fundamentalism still held as taboo. And so with that, um, I got caught up in that as a young fundamentalist, and I was really hardcore into the reform movement probably for the next six years into college. I, it was Driscoll that really, and following him, John Piper and Tim Keller and right. all, all those fun people, uh, <laughs> really shaped me, um, again, because that theology was so appealing, um, again, to be chosen by God. So, went off to Bible college with this neo-reform bent, but the problem with my Bible college was that Moody Bible Institute, where I went, is in the heart of downtown Chicago. And so I would be in my classroom, and we'd be in dorms, and I'd hear all of this conservative theology, and we would all talk about our love for John Calvin and all of that good stuff. And then I'd walk out the door into the real world and realized, one, that my theology didn't square with reality in the big city. Like, I was experiencing all sorts of different people that all seemed to have vibrant faith and live were living good lives and had connections to God, and my theology had no room for that. Yeah, they're all um, going to hell. Right. I mean, I remember one of the—it sounds so absurd years later, but— Uh, Down the street from Moody is um, Holy Name Cathedral, a big, beautiful Catholic church. Mm -hmm. And John Piper had this, he has this sermon you can watch on YouTube, where he is just railing against the Catholic church as being this blasphemous, uh, great whore of Babylon, and talking about the Catholic mass as this very evil thing. 
And I remember watching that video and then going to Catholic Mass at Holy Name Cathedral and being blown away at how beautiful and profound and scripture-rich it was. And it was those little experiences that started making me really see how flawed the system of belief was, and I started asking questions. Um, and really what ended up shifting me completely um, and putting me on the slippery slope that has ended where I'm at today um, is I started a podcast and I started blogging and I started interviewing people that were heretics, so to speak, from the neo-reformed world, uh, everyone from N.T. Wright to Brian McLaren to those kind of people. And as I interviewed these people, one, I got a very negative response from my entire Bible college community because, again, you're not supposed to fraternize with heretics. You're not supposed to give them legitimacy, yeah. and I was. And I was just really compelled by their theology, which seemed a lot more open and loving and honest. And so I started going down this path, and I became a progressive evangelical, and that continued uh, to where I am today. And I don't know that I would identify um, probably broadly Christian, but definitely a lot more open to admitting that I don't have any answers, and I actually don't think finding answers to the big questions of life is the point anymore. Um, but it all began with that honest search, that honest willingness to question. And one thing that I've always said is when your theology and reality come into conflict, reality is going to win every time. It should win every time. Yeah. Um, and that's really what shifted me. Yeah, that is. that seems to be one of the more common experiences, I think, at least from what I've gathered from people that I know and even just myself personally, because I had a sort of similar background uh, shift, I guess, through my teen years and into young adulthood, where it was like I grew up in more of a charismatic Pentecostal type uh, community church. It was pretty small. It wasn't like a mega church or anything. And I grew up with that same feeling of, you know, we have the right theology, you know, we are in, we are on the good team, and, you know, most other people have it wrong. And, you know, one of the aha moments was probably like around ages 14 and 15. I've talked about this a bit on the podcast, but like I just started noticing uh, in different sermons at the church I was going to, there was a lot of uh, conflating American conservative politics with mm. theology. You know, like election cycles would come through and there'd be these different um, really popular sermons that would get kind of pushed across the country. Like there was this one I remember called the Seven Mountain Mandate. And yeah. it was like a pretty popular uh, sermon being spread around, which is like all about how Christians need to reclaim all these different branches of life. You know, it's government, education, the arts and all this. And a lot of the, the following rhetoric that came into all that was just really... It was just very confusing for me as a kid, and I was sort of similar to you in the curiosity, maybe like slightly rebellious sense where it just didn't really jive with me on a personal level, so I started questioning that. And it really just, over the next few years, like into my late teenhood, the more I spoke with people who were different from me, with different backgrounds and different faiths and just different general identities, you know, it really started to make me realize how, I guess, just me personally, I don't want to, I guess, speak as a broad brush of everyone and from the church I grew up with, but for me, I felt like I was just really painting this tribal picture in my mind growing up that was really off, you know, and I was, there was people I was friends with who came out as gay or lesbian, like, around, I guess it would have been my senior in high school, so I was, like, about 18, and at that time, I remember, like, starting the relationships I had with those friends of mine and feeling like, oh, wow, like, their lifestyle is in the wrong, and then, like, sort of semester would go by in school and, like, start hanging out with this certain group of people, and then all of a sudden, it's, like, chinks in the armor, you know, like, certain relationships and certain events happen, and you just start to see people through a different lens, and then it's like, oh, my God, wait, was I wrong all those years? Were my beliefs that far off? You know, am I, have I been mistreating people this whole time? You sort of have to start that unraveling process of who you are so it's interesting totally. to hear like we sounds like we actually had a pretty similar journey i never hit the mark driscoll 
point, <laughs> but I, I, I jumped right into Tim Keller, so I skipped Driscoll uh, and just jumped right to him. <laughs> I would have assumed with a beard like yours, you would have spent a little bit of time in the Driscoll camp. I, <laughs> <laughs> That's very assumptuous of you. <laughs> I did I did catch a couple YouTube videos, like the ones you were saying, him just yelling. I remember yeah. there was like a couple viral videos of his where he is just yell preaching and me i remember i do remember watching that and being like wow this is interesting like i've never seen someone yell like this before but i didn't didn't get too deep into it but but yeah i'm interested to know like how how many years ago was all this like 10 years ago it's hard i I always say numbers and they're always wrong Um, (laughs) it's i graduated bible college in 2014 so the big deconstruction for me happened from 2010 to 2014. Okay. Um, and then I became a complete liberal heretic 2015, 16, <laughs> 17. So Right. So so after once you, once you hit that point, like did you completely discard all like did you discard Driscoll, Keller, Piper or was there sort of like a long death of deconstruction or what was that like in the aftermath? For me, what was so interesting is I hear so many stories of people who are go through these faith shifts. And I guess on one hand, it was kind of traumatic in some ways, and there were some dramatic moments. But again, because I've always had that inner curiosity, I feel like there was never really just one moment or a a period of time where my faith completely changed. It wasn't like a slow death, because even when I was hardcore neo-reformed and really worshiping at the altar of Mark Driscoll, I was still... (laughs) I was reading things I shouldn't have been reading, like mm-hmm. uh, hiding uh, books under my pillow like porn magazines. It was like <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, but all of, but I would say that, and I think this is kind of just part of the natural phases of growing up. Um, and I, I was thinking about that as we were both sharing our stories. Our stories are so similar, and our stories reflect an entire generation of people that come from the kind of faith background that we're at. And it says something about the quality of the faith that we kind of have grown up in. Uh, Most conservative Christians, once they hit college and start having some real world world experience, just find that it doesn't work anymore. Um, And mine, um, Bible college was so traumatic for me in the sense that they tried to kick me out six times over four years um, for heresy every time. (laughs) And then my senior year, it was because uh, I was outed by a trusted professor as struggling with same-sex attraction. And so that was a whole other problem that we can get to. Uh, So when I graduated Moody, by the grace of God, quite literally, I wasn't sure that I was going to get my diploma. Um, I I did have a moment where I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I believe. This whole thing is so messed up. And then right after Moody, I moved back to D.C., um, and stumbled into a job in a national religious political organization as the national spokesperson. And I came out as supporting marriage equality um, literally six months after Moody um, in Time Magazine and had the whole Southern Baptist Convention write an op-ed the next day and take to um, the radio the next day and condemn me as a heretic again. (laughs) And so at that point, I was just like, screw this. Like, this is so stupid. (laughs) Yeah. And, I mean, it really was in that period of time. um, Some people reached out to me, people like Brian McLaren, and they extended love and grace, and their theology was able to handle all of my messiness. And I think that became what, healed me and what eventually gave me a very different kind of faith, a faith that my 12-year-old self would be horrified of today, <laughs> but a faith that's actually sustainable and um, and honest and authentic. And I, again, I feel like that's a journey that so many people um, in our generation go through, especially in these college and post-college years. Yeah, I've, I've really found in my small town community, at least right outside Philadelphia, there's a lot of these different local church communities. I mean, we're in Pennsylvania, so it's already like a really old area. There's a lot of old Mennonite heritage in this area, but there's also just a lot of 
I'd say like middle class, upper middle class, white people that either grew up in Philly or even from different states. You know, we have a lot of people move from different areas to come to this area just to settle down. And you get this yeah. really, this big small town bubble feel. And I think for a lot of the friends that I still have that maintain their conservative Christian ideologies in a town like ours, it's really easy to do that because if you're in this small town community and you're going to church and you're growing up with a lot of the same people, it's easy to sort of maintain those beliefs because everything works within that structure, which is just really interesting Like to kind of coincide with what you were saying, how you moved when you went to, to school, to seminary, and you were going in Chicago and you were meeting all these different uh, walks of life. I think that's – so. it's sort of stereotypical. Like it's – I mean it's kind of – people talk about it pretty often. I mean, obviously cities are like magnets for culture. So you have Mm -hmm. just people from all over the world and all sorts of differences between, you know, we have different ethnic groups, you have different sexualities, you have different religious people, you have pretty much every um, thing that separates us coming together in one small area. And I think that is in an odd way, like the big difference, I think, between, you know, maybe past generations and, more current generations where I think cities have always been, I guess, the sort of focus point of where culture moved the fastest. But it seems like at least in Western culture for a long time, you know, we had that sort of suburban rural feel to like where a lot of uh, the religious movements were taking place. And as cities have really grown and people have become more integrated with each other, it does seem like that is one of the, Probably, I I think at least, one of the biggest reasons why we've seen the expedited pace of progressivism in the past few years. Because you have people flocking to the cities, and then you have social media to connect them. And it's like, sort of just working hand in hand, where it's just that really quick change for people. Yeah, I totally agree. I think, I mean, the rate of urbanization is, I think, in all across Europe and now finally hitting North America is exactly what is causing the death of a certain kind of uh, organized religion, not just Christianity. And it's also why that Christianity, conservative fundamentalism and Pentecostalism is growing in the global South, because that same rate of urbanization is very different. Our organized religion works best in the suburbs. It works best in tribal settings. Yeah. Um, And actual urban cities where you're exposed to so many different worldviews and so many different realities that clash, you can't have an organized system really to explain that. It doesn't work. Right. Yeah, that's that's really true. I, I don't want to go too far here without going back to something that you were just talking about when you're kind of going through that roller coaster of post-college and then getting all that publicity and then getting torn down again. You know, you'd started that off by saying you've been outed by one of your professors. <laughs> so that's yeah. I don't want to just skip over that. I mean, this is that sounds horrific. I mean, especially for like the timing of that. You said this would have been 2014. Yeah. Right. So this was like before marriage equality was legalized. And like what can you kind of go through what that was like for you on a personal level and like a communal level? Like did that cause separation with your friend groups and your peers or what was going on? Yeah. So, I mean, the sexuality pieces also obviously um, has shaped my worldview, my faith, everything um, in significant ways. I knew that I struggled with same-sex attraction, or however I would have put it, um, back when I was probably about 16. But I repressed, 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 got to Bible college and kind of uh, breathed a sigh of relief and thought, now that I've crossed this line, I'm finally going to prepare to be a pastor. This is not going to be an issue for me anymore. Um, And Moody kind of also, I mean, toxic evangelical culture, they kind of guarantee uh, that if you come to their campus in four years, you're going to leave with a degree, a pastoral job, and a wife. And so I was really hoping that that was... the package. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And so I went to Moody, and my first week at Bible College, um, on my dorm floor, I met this guy who would become my best friend, uh, and he confessed to me within probably a week or two of being at Bible College. He said, Brandon, I struggle with same-sex attraction. And for the first time in years, I said, me too. 
And it kind of opened Pandora's box at that moment wow. because this thing I thought I was running from was now something that was being talked about. And again, not to be, people will have a hard time believing this when I tell them, but I held, I was the assistant RA on my dorm floor and we had about 30 guys and I think it was 12 or 13 of them all came out to me as struggling with same-sex attraction. Wow. And then I was the chaplain of the Moody Men's Collegiate Choir, which is as stereotypical as it comes. And I would say 50% of the people that I talked to and that would share their sin struggles in some way had questions about their sexuality. Uh, and what I, Moody just became this place, this magnet almost, of people struggling to understand their gender identity and their sexuality, which is really good for me in one way. <laughs> like it, it allowed me space to begin thinking about this um, and really bad for their conservative evangelical program in the sense that there's just so much of that conversation that wasn't a lot being allowed to have. It wasn't talked about publicly. And so it was pushed to the shadows and in the shadows, people start doing unhealthy things. Um, there are lots of unhealthy sexual behaviors happening at Moody that I would know about. And it just kept this conversation going in my mind um, and in my world. And we had a pretty well-known ex-gay professor at Moody, one of the most popular professors on campus. Um, and I confessed my sin struggle to him with same-sex attraction because all the gay men on campus did that. Um, and me and him became really close friends. Um, he referred to me as a friend, not as a student, not as a mentor. We had a really mm. deep trust oriented relationship. And then uh, as my blog and as my podcast back then started getting a little bit more traction um, and I was interviewing more uh, fringe, so to speak, theologians and pastors. Um, basically my junior year that summer, this professor saw me at the Wild Goose Festival with Nadia Boltzweber, who he assumed um, was not straight, um, and took that picture from my Facebook and sent it to the entire faculty of Moody and said, look at what this, this guy's doing. He's confessed to me that he struggles with same-sex oh attraction, and God. now he's hanging out with people encouraging that. Um, and so I walked back onto campus my senior year, first day back, and got my choir teacher, I was the chaplain, so we had a deep kind of close relationship. He came and said, Brandon, you need to come with me. Took me to the dean's office. The dean, uh, and this line is in the beginning of the book, True Inclusion. The dean looked at me and said, Brandon, I understand your struggle. Um, I understand what you're doing, uh, interviewing all of these people. I just want to make sure that when you leave Moody, you don't start waving rainbow flags. And, uh, <laughs> and what followed from that wow. was pressure. They basically said, if you want to show us your good faith, that you are actually aligning your life with a biblical sexual uh, principle, then you should go to con uh, this conversion therapy program that we do here on campus. Um, and so I did that for a year. And it was kind of the requirement in order for me to graduate. And uh, honestly, my program that I went through was not like so many of the other traumatic programs that are now becoming public. Um, mine was not too bad. But what I found over the course of the year was I was actually getting healed from all sorts of childhood trauma through this therapy. But my sexual identity was only getting stronger like as I became more of a whole person. Mm. Um, and so by the time I got to the end of my senior year, I knew that I was a bisexual, a queer, whatever word I wanted to use, a man. And I just didn't feel like God thought it was a problem. I didn't know the theology, but I didn't feel that God had a problem with it. Um, and so when I graduated, that contributed to my disillusionment with faith and where I was going to head and if I could still be a pastor and all of those questions. It's so interesting. It's like it almost had like a therapeutic effect where you hadn't been able to talk about this for so long and now you're in this gay conversion situation where you're forced to bring this stuff to the surface. And instead of it making you afraid of it or reject it, it made you embrace it like, oh, yeah, this is this is who I am. <laughs> was it yeah. like that? I mean, it was it, like 
I still have like a weird soft spot and uh, this always makes people uncomfortable and I don't mean to um, disregard experiences of people who've had really bad conversion therapy experiences, but all we would do was uh, we would, I would first confess my sin in these sessions. So if I had any bad, lustful thoughts about men, but then we would go back, we would enter into a time of prayer and ask God to reveal moments in my childhood of great trauma. Mm. Um, and so you'd rewalk through these traumatic moments. And the idea was that people become gay because their father was abusive and their mother was overattached. And so if we heal that, uh, then you won't be gay anymore. And uh, what actually ended up happening for me was, yeah, I did reprocess so much of the trauma that had been impacting my life in a negative way. But it didn't make me not gay. It just made me a healthier person. And I think it actually had a very negative impact on the woman who was doing my conversion therapy because she saw that I was healthy. And then she saw that I came out a year later. Um, and uh, last I heard was she had left Moody after that um, wow. and went to an intensive conversion therapy program for herself because the program wasn't working. Um, yeah. Anyways, it's so interesting. Yeah, that entire that it's so crazy how this is just a few years ago too, because yeah. I hear stories from the '90s and the early 2000s with this stuff. Like I forget, I think the school is called CEDU. Do you, do you know that school it was out in California? Um, huh. It was. I'm pretty sure it was Northern California. It was C E D U. And they're one of these schools, like, I think they got shut down in 2004, but that was one of the portions of the school. I think it was, like, uh, pe pe parents would send their troubled kids to this place. So it was one of those, almost like a, like a youth rehab place where, like, parents would pay, like, if your kid had an addiction or was struggling with gay urges or whatever. Yeah. It, it might be you send your kid there for six months, and then they heal him and send him back. And there have been so many cases, like, documented ones, if you look it up online, of, I think there was, like, I don't know how many suicides and kids went missing. Like, some kids were found dead. And it's just like, and those are, like, the only ones, like, that was just documented. Like, there was a bunch, obviously, undocumented. And this place, like, disbanded i'm pretty sure it was in like the early 2000s like 2004 so it is like it's wild how there's all these different experiences and this has been going on for decades and decades and decades with pretty much no i mean i guess there was some was there at some point like maybe in like the 60s or 70s some like pseudo or very like ill-advised psychological backing from studies or something like i don't even know where this stuff originated from when it comes yeah. to that but it's like it's insane that that's just a few years ago like i'm, I'm having yeah. a hard time even processing it like that well and what it, i mean again you're right i mean it's only been nice i'm pretty certain within the past decade that um the american psychological association determined that you couldn't change sexuality or gender so right. well, that's a 10-year period and there are a number of psychological associations that still promote it um and I just, I mean, discovered three days ago that there's a large church here in San Diego. Um, and I I typed in Gay Friendly Church San Diego on Google. And you scroll down four um, results. And you click on this conservative church, and it leads you to their reparative therapy ministry. Oh and I was God. so stunned. But this is literally the largest church in the area. And they're very open about, we're going to heal you. Um, so it's still happening. And it's all over the place they bought that search engine optimization to to get up there on google that's insane yeah yeah <laughs> uh, so i mean that's a pretty good segue into your recent books i mean this true inclusion just came out was it a couple weeks ago uh september 11th awesome so i mean for people who don't know like can you i mean you, you just mentioned it a few moments ago but can you share a bit uh like what it's about and like what inspired you to write it totally so i've been um in this space, uh, well, I didn't choose this space, but ended up in the space of uh, speaking about sexuality and gender in particular, particularly conservative evangelical contexts for the past five or six years now. Um, and basically, as I've worked with, I've gotten a chance to work with a lot of churches, a lot of larger churches that have moved from being non-inclusive, non-affirming, to being fully open and inclusive, um, and walked with them on that journey. And so that work. Um, I became a little, I had a little bit of a platform in the evangelical world for that. And a publisher came to me about two years ago and said, 
Brandon, this is great. We're so glad to see all these churches doing this inclusive work. But does it end when they finally just announce that they're inclusive? Does it end uh, with the LGBT issue? Is that really where this whole inclusive journey is meant to end? And that was the question they posed to me. And at the time, I really didn't know an answer. Um, for me, yes, that is where it ended. I, that was what I was investing my time and energy into, just making people LGBT inclusive. But in the year after I signed the contract and began thinking about this, I became a pastor myself of an inclusive church and began really seeing that if you take the inclusive, an inclusive reading of the Gospels, if you take an inclusive understanding of the ethical trajectory of Scripture seriously, um, and if you understand how oppression and injustice works um, in a systemic way in society, then if you're going to embrace inclusion, um, it has to necessarily impact almost every area of how we think and do life and ministry. Right. And so for me, it came down to I spent my master's degree studying sexuality and gender in the first century, and I discovered that this system called patriarchy, which I understand as not just the oppression of women, but the oppression of sexual minorities, the oppression of racial and uh, racial minorities and people who are lower class economically. You have this patriarchal system that is meant to push those people down and elevate straight, cisgender, dominant culture men. Um, and when you see that system at work and you understand Jesus in light of living in a patriarchal culture, but always consistently subverting the boundaries and really, in many ways, the early church following Jesus challenged so much of these fundamental building blocks of patriarchy. Um, once I began to see that, and I also began to see these movements like Black Lives Matter and Me Too emerge in our culture, I really began to be convicted and convinced that in my own church and in all churches, if we're going to be inclusive, we need to consistently be challenging every way that this patriarchal system manifests itself. And in the book, I talk about that as through pursuing intersectional justice. Mm. Um, and that word intersectionality is used a lot now, but it basically just means that all oppression is tied to one another and therefore all liberation is tied to one another. So a black queer woman, you can't just include the queer part of her. You have to include right. the woman and the blackness, and you have to deconstruct all of those systems at the same time. Otherwise, she's still an oppressed person. Um, and that really means that you have to shift your theology and your practice and your politics. And um, yeah, this book ended up being a surprise at the end of it when I kind of looked at the finished product, because it challenges even all of my preconceived notions. I come to the conclusion that if you're going to be inclusive, you're never going to have a big church. Um, that if you're going to be inclusive, you have to get used to having a revolving door with people coming in, getting healed, and leaving your church. Right. Like all of these conclusions, um, which fly in the face of everything that you're taught in seminary. So, Yeah, can you, just before we go any further, I'd be interested to hear from where you're coming from in the book. Like, can you just give like a brief history of patriarchy and just like maybe like list a couple of the ways it still tangibly affects our culture today? Totally. Um, I mean, patriarchy is the oldest ordering of society um, in human history. Um, and it, in our culture, it manifests as um, European, straight men, um, usually of middle class to upper class economic wealth. But even in the most ancient societies, there was always a ruling class of people. And it was generally in most societies, um, men who kind of, uh, there's been this cultural conception of manhood that has generally been embraced across many cultures for thousands of years. And that's Man is a penetrator. Man is dominant. Man yeah. is oppressive. It's very man, physical. Yeah. And so you look at that and you see that almost universally there are some exceptions. Um, but in the Hebrew Bible in particular and in our tradition as Christians, um, this is the building block from the beginning of Genesis through the entire Hebrew Bible. It's the setup of a culture and a society built on patriarchy. And 
The problem is that the writers of the Hebrew Bible took this cultural system and they said God ordained it. Um, and so now you have God who is at the top of this patriarchal system. He is the, in the context of the Hebrew uh, person, he is the Jewish man. He's masculine. He wants to dominate. He wants to kill. He wants to right. penetrate. Um, and what that does is then underneath that system, you have that ruling class of men, and then everyone else is oppressed. Everyone else is limited in their ability to fully express who they are. Um, they're forced into certain societal positions. Um, they're forced to be slaves. They're forced to be sexual objects. And then the New Testament comes along, and this is still the predominant system. Um, and this is what Paul is functioning in, and Paul doesn't really do a great job of challenging the patriarchy, and most of the people around Jesus don't do a great job of challenging the system. But Jesus comes along, and the assault on the religious system of his day and the political system is an assault on patriarchy. Mm. Um, he's speaking against a government and a religious environment that privileged a certain type of man, a certain type of economic status, a certain type of gender identity and sexuality. And he spent time and empowered all of those whom patriarchy was pushing to the edges. And in his own body, uh, being a Jewish man, um, being celibate from what we can tell, being crucified, um, that, that image of crucifixion is the most... Uh, clear image of patriarchy because the whole reason Rome crucified people was to show its penetrative power. Mm. So on the cross, Jesus being pierced time and time again was in a masculization. That's the Roman Empire saying, you're not a man. You have no power. You're worse than a woman. You are penetrated. You are beaten. You're bloodied. You're dead. Right. Um, and so we have all this imagery in the Christian tradition that says, if Jesus is willing in traditional Christian theology, to go to the cross and embrace this emasculization. And then the Christian image later on is of a lamb that is slain forever. Jesus, when he rises from the dead, the image is that he's still pierced forever. Uh, that's a distinct image that everyone in the first century would have recognized as a feminine image, as a forever pierced lamb that's not coming to conquer, but who comes by empowering, him, uh, empowering those on the margins and by laying down his life for those whom patriarchy has continually oppressed. I mean, this is the thrust of the Christian message. And it's, again, if you don't understand the first century context of how patriarchy developed and how it impacts society, then you'd never see this. Right. Um, but once I started seeing it, you see it everywhere. And then you begin looking at the church today. Um, the church in America is heavily patriarchal. We are so conditioned to elevate white, well-educated men to positions of power. Those men spend a lot of their time as pastors trying to get into proximity with government officials. So there's this mixing of religious and political power. And the moment you start challenging these people, um, these systems, you see this backlash that we're currently living in where there have been movements recently uh, asking the question, why are white straight men the ones who get to have all the power? And all of a sudden we get the election of Donald Trump. And I'm not saying it's the only reason Donald Trump won the election, but right, right, yeah. he is the embodiment of patriarchy exactly. in many ways. Yeah. So I'm rambling, but no, no, that, that, that's why you're here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it. No, I'm really, I'm really interested to know from your perspective, because this is something like just hearing all of that and kind of going through your experience over the course of your life that you've been unraveling here. I'm really inter interested to know with all that said, how do you personally then reclaim the religion of Christianity with those original texts that are always going to be there. Because like you and I, so like from where we, we sit right now, you know, we come from, you know, this sort of forward trajectory where our views are shifting and moving over years. And we're starting to see a lot of these ancient texts as stories and we can kind of place them contextually in their time and place. And that helps us to kind of move our own, uh, 
about faith and our own ethical frameworks forward. But like when it comes to just the overarching religion, I mean, Christianity is obviously it's one of the huge world religions. Like how do you personally see us moving forward within this framework while the text still exists as it does? So that's a hard question. Um, and I think my most honest answer is I don't know that Christianity can actually be redeemed. I don't know mm. that any of these cultural, political, or religious systems that are so inherently uh, patriarchal can be redeemed. I mean, the Jesus movement started as an anti-patriarchy movement, but as soon as we get to Constantine and we see Christianity being turned into an imperial force— um, it has so diluted what Christianity is, and that's almost 2,000 years of that. Like, I just don't know um, that the religion itself can be fully redeemed, and that's the scary conclusion that I do come to in the book, and it's it's funny. The book was uh, number one on Amazon's church growth uh, list yesterday, and in the book, I literally say, if you're going to embrace true inclusion, your church is never going to grow. Like, um, it, was, it was quite ironic because I don't, as people are liberated from patriarchy, as people are liberated from these systems that have oppressed cultures and genuine expressions of identity, they often don't want to go back and reclaim a tradition. They want to right. go discover new or more indigenous traditions. And one thing that I'm seeing and that I suggest in the book well, I'll say this first. In the book, I say the real role of the institution of Christianity, if we're going to be authentic, if we're going to be um, a tool of liberation, is first to stop being organized religion and become religion for the purpose of organizing, meaning seeing the church as primarily a vehicle that is meant to bring people together in order to do tangible action in the world, uh, tangible acts of justice in the world. So that changes the church from being a religious environment primarily to being a social and political environment. Yeah. And then the secondary thing is the religious service that we do on Sundays. And I've often said this, and uh, I always am a little nervous as a pastor saying this, but if I wasn't a pastor, if I wasn't uh, doing this job, I don't think I would go to church. Mm. Um, church is the, what I do on Sundays, though, where I find it important, is for those who are trying, who need a place to heal, who need a place to process the trauma of patriarchy, of being excluded, of being hurt by toxic religion. And what I often find at our church is we'll get people that show up at our church, they'll be involved in our service, they'll love it, they'll rave about how it's beautiful because we're using the same old forms and songs and reclaiming them in a redemptive way, they'll be a part of our church for six months, and then they'll leave and go find something else to do on Sunday mornings. And I don't see that as a loss anymore. I see that as a victory. That's what we are meant to be doing, to allow people to come and heal, to begin to be exposed to new ways of expressing faith and spirituality. And most often we're discovering people move outside of the institution and go find another way of expressing faith. And that I think is the new role of the church. It's a deinstitutionalization. It's moving us towards our death. But I think that's if we're going to be truly inclusive, if we're going to work for a truly just and equal world, that's what the institution becomes. I love that. I mean, that's exactly where, again, personally, like I've I've fallen into where, for me, it was like growing up the way I did in that conservative evangelical uh, framework. And then when I abandoned it, when I was about 18, I went full atheist for a little bit and, you know, dabbled with agnosticism where I just kind of felt, okay, maybe I'm not sure about what's going on as much as I wanted to be sure. Cause I, you know, a lot, of, a lot of atheists are just very certain, um, ex religious people who now <laughs> like, crave that same certainty. But I yeah. mean, it's like, I kind of went through that phase and ended up having, this is just total tangent. I don't need to get into this, but I ended up having a mental breakdown, um, a couple years, about four years into it. And in the aftermath of that, I went back to the church that I went to growing up. And it, for about, I want to say, 
two and a half years, maybe, I stayed within that community and kind of started at square one. So I went back to fundamentalism, just kind of like that's when I got really deep into Calvinism and I was trying to kind of reconfigure my roots a little bit. And then started slowly you know, dipping back into more progressivism and just going down in that direction. And after that, like, two or three-year period was up, I left the church. And I haven't been back since. But that period, like, that season of my life, it really got me back on my feet. It got me more, like, firm in my identity. I felt more comfortable yeah. in who I was and what I was thinking. And I see this all the time. I mean, I don't know if you follow... Uh, Stephanie Jury at all. She, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and she runs that uh, page, Stuff Christian Culture Likes, and she's talked about this a lot, where the page itself, it's very deconstructive in nature, where she posts a lot of just what's going wrong in Christian culture, you know, scandals with pastors or just drama that's happening or horrific acts with the Catholic Church, whatever it might be. And she'll post all about this stuff, and the community that it garners on her uh, social media pages is a community of people who need a space to deconstruct. Like, they need to feel like they're not alone. They need to feel like there's other people with similar backgrounds who are coming together to kind of process through whatever this thing is. And she says the same exact thing all the time, where the the nature and the sort of um, the face of people who visit those pages that changes every few months. You know, it's a, it's a constant turnover of people that come and they get what they need and then they leave. You know, you don't stay in that space forever, which I think you're right. Like that is, I think the old model or the old model was you grew up in a church and you ended up staying in that church your whole life. And then there's gener- multiple generations building on that community. Whereas a lot more of what I think we're seeing here is that people grow up in a community and they jump to another community and they jump to another community and they're kind of constantly, you know, stumbling down this trajectory almost, you know, trying to figure out who they are. And it's not this um, stationary thing like it used to be. Yeah. And I mean, and the only and the caveat is also, I think there is an increased um in this generation, at least, there's at least an increased interest in some of the older forms of the Christian church, some of the um, rhythms and liturgies. And I think that's, if the institution is going to survive, it's going to be in places that embrace a more contemplative or a more, uh, where pastors become priests once again. And our job isn't to give answers or truth, uh, but to hold sacred space. I think there's going to be always a group of people that long for that kind of Christian faith. And so, like for us, we started last week this contemplative service on Wednesday nights at our church, and I think that will become our primary service over the next couple of years, because Sunday morning, that whole thing is just built on this notion that there is a powerful man who's meant to give you truth that you can't find anywhere else and speak on behalf of God and perform actions for you to help you get right with God. Like that system just doesn't work yeah. anymore. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested to know, kind of just going back a little bit to your book, have you, like, I know it's only been out for a little bit, but like with you talking about all this, you fit into the camp a little bit, if I'm not mistaken. Now I'm being a little bit assumptuous here, but like, are you a fan of Rob Bell or like Richard Rohr? Totally. Both of them have been huge mentors and influences. And yeah, I think I have my critiques of them too, but yeah, I'll just say yes. (laughs) (laughs) Same here. It's always really strange whenever you kind of give a uh, endorsement almost of anybody because you're like, well, it's, it's good to stay critical of the people that you even are inspired by. Like, you know, that's, yeah. that, I'm with you on that. But it's interesting because, like, a lot of the, the way you talk about a lot of these things kind of fits in a similar wheelhouse to how they talk about it. And obviously, you know, for those who don't know, I'm sure most people listening to this do, but Rob Bell is a figure who's been completely ostracized from the evangelical community and ripped to shreds. He's, he's sort of like the primary target of a heretic 
a slippery slope, um, someone who you don't want to be dealing with. So, I mean, with, with how you kind of are going through, you know, a lot of this like more progressive outlook on even like you're talking about liturgy and kind of going back to the roots with a lot of these ways of doing things in a, prog- in a new progressive way. Like, have you received any criticism publicly recently? Like not even just with your book, but have you like, do you get a lot of flack from evangelical culture and like do you expect continual like do you sort of continually expect backlash when you put out work or what is that like for you yeah i think honestly um after my i think becoming becoming coming out as gay uh, (laughs) kind of pushed me over a line where most of the evangelical world no longer finds me relevant Uh, Mm. and i haven't just too far gone yeah, I mean, once you jump that boat, and it, it's true, um, once I started saying things like what Rob Bell says all the time, that I'm not interested in orthodoxy, I don't care about fitting into a right system of belief, like, once you become honest about that and are empowered enough to say, I really just don't care about playing in a theological system anymore, then they you can't make a critique of me from a conservative evangelical standpoint, because... All you can say is, he's not playing our game anymore. We're playing golf and he's playing tennis. Like, it doesn't work. Um, And so, uh, like, on the book, there's two negative reviews so far on Amazon. And, of course, I've read them word for word and memorized most (laughs) of of them. Of course, yeah. But I love the honesty of one guy. His review was, if I shared Robertson's theological convictions, my review would be higher. (laughs) Like, that is the evangelical look. Yeah, at folks, like us that step beyond the boundaries it's they understand that we're just in such a different system that there's not even a good way to leverage a critique and they have no authority if i'm not playing in the christian uh world if i'm not reliant on the publishing industry of evangelicalism what leverage do they have Um, right and yeah that's so true. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Like that entire system, again, going back to talking about like, the patriarchal system, that is the entire, like, uh, what do you call it? I don't want to just kind of boil it down to capitalism, but it's a very uh, capitalist movement within yeah. the uh, evangelical movement itself. It's like a subset where you have like these pu- huge, huge publishing companies and then these huge mega churches and obviously all the people that run the seminaries and it's like generations and generations of people who are controlling information and now i guess you don't have to play that because we have social media and you can find more people to to get the target audiences that you're looking for and these online communities and in-person communities that just we would have had a very difficult time doing that even just a few years ago yeah and it's a lot less sexy and a lot less lucrative and uh i lament that sometimes in my most cynical moments of like <laughs> dang those evangelicals right, have it made they make but... so much money <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm really interested to to know this is just a personal interest of mine like i'm I want to know, like, in your own experience, when it comes to how people shift their views of just LGBTQ plus in general, I mean, obviously there are situations with parents who have children or a loved one that make them change their views. But, like, in your experience, have there been any, like, specific aha moments that, in your mind, tend to initiate that? Or is it just really different for everyone? So... On this, and some people would definitely disagree, but I would say it's not different at all in almost every case that I've seen a shift from the highest mega church pastor to the grandma. Um, it's always the same thing. And that's that was a revelation in my last book, Our Witness, that I really tried to make clear. And it's not what I'm about to say is not stunning at all. I think we all already know this is true. But the only way that people shift their mind on LGBT issues in particular, but I think on most issues, is in a context of a relationship. Um, I spent my first couple of years out of Bible college going into fundamentalist spaces and debating people on stages in front of a couple thousand evangelicals about LGBT issues. And it took so much energy and was such a toxic environment for me to be in. And once I stepped out of it and started looking, there was no fruit, so to speak. Like, yeah. nobody changed their mind. A few people, the only change that I ever saw was people would come up to me afterwards and say, 
you were really nice and kind and sweet. And that other person was a total jackass. Like they were terrible. So we like you better, but we still agree with the other person. Um, that was <laughs> wow. the most progress I saw. Um, but then when I started taking meetings with people, I spent a good two years flying around the country, just meeting with well-known church leaders from various denominations, from the Mormon church to the Southern Baptist convention and just forming relationships with them. And as those people started to know me, I started seeing rhetoric soften. Um, as there's a couple mega church pastors in our country that told me during that period of my life, they were like, yeah, my daughter is gay or my nephew is gay. And I'm now really confused as to what I should say publicly. Mm. Um, it's always that personal connection. It's always that they know somebody that is LGBT. And when that experience comes into clash with their theology, like I said earlier, their experience always has to win because you have to live in a real world, not in the ideological world. Um, and for a lot of people, it takes five years before they're able to articulate a new theological perspective. Mm. But most people's hearts change rather quickly when you start hearing just how hard it is to be gay in a conservative church or to be gay in a conservative family. Um, it, in every situation, comes down to that personal relationship and empathic understanding that forms in the context of a personal relationship. Right. Yeah, I'm totally with you on that. And it's interesting to even, like, as of 2018, I think, especially with the ramping up of social media culture, you get a lot of the most progressive voices coming together on, say, Twitter or Facebook or Reddit or whatever they might be. And it kind of creates this image where, okay, like, we as a culture have moved past this and, okay, we are embracing of like lgbtq plus but i think people often forget because of that then that there's somewhere around 50 percent of the america at least as a country who aren't aligned with those values yet at all and there's still this like major divide between families and communities and different uh, demographic uh areas or and um i just think it's really important to always keep that conversation vibrant because there's definitely this i don't know what you want to call like it's not really i guess it is kind of like a cynicism where if you exist online a lot like my job's on social media so i hang out online all the time and when you get in these bubbles you get the feeling like okay this is like where we are at as a culture but it's and it's really easy just to neglect and forget that you know there is this other huge very important chunk of the culture who isn't on the same page and you know and learning to have those conversations and share those experiences like like i think like you mentioned there where there's people that you've talked to who are pastors that came forward who said you know hey i have a daughter or i have a son who's out like i don't know how to talk to them or i'm reevaluating how i should talk to them i think in a lot of cases that's still a very very frequent occurrence where there might be pastors or just you know, adults in general who have children that they know are out, but they are like, they're so ashamed and they don't have anyone in their community to talk to about it. So mm. they're in that place where they maybe have had like their heart shift because they love their kid, but theologically they they aren't able to move forward because they don't have the community or the resources to get there. So, I mean, like how is it like, I know you're like, you're very deeply involved in this activism. So you're on a different playing field, I think altogether, but I mean, is this still like a relevant piece of uh, conversation for you? Yeah. So there's two things I'll say about that. One, you've already touched on it earlier. And I think we can't overemphasize the rural versus urban divide in this country. Um, it is the reason we are politically divided. It is the reason that half the country is homophobic and Islamophobic because more and more people are moving to cities and that's where industry and culture and everything is moving. And then there are these people left to not to be condescending, but in the fields in the middle of America, right. uh, in small towns and gay people aren't going to come out in that small town. There's no good reason. And if you're gay, you're going to move to a city. Um, that's generally what happens. And so they're not interacting with Muslims or gay people or people of color of any kind. And 
if you're not interacting with them, you can believe all sorts of crazy things about people from a distance. Um, and it's, again, it has nothing to do with their intellect. It has nothing to do with anything like that. It's just, if I don't experience a gay person, then I am going to think that they just get naked on pride floats and do sex and drugs because that's yeah. what you see. Um, so I really do think that we need to do hard work, both as religious people and as cultural influencers, to figure out how we don't forget and provide resources to those in rural areas to expose them to more um, diversity, frankly. And the second aspect is I do spend so much of my time. I mean, in just a couple of weeks, we have a, a private off the record gathering of it will be 40 leaders, 20 conservative evangelical pastors and 20 LGBT leaders. I spend a lot of time in those spaces. And what I've learned every single time in those spaces is that for those who are at the top, those who have the influence and the money um, and are at the top of the capitalistic ladder, whether that's political, religious, or other, uh, they don't have any vested interest in changing. Right. And even when I spend so much time putting them in contact with LGBT people in their community, and even when I build relationships with them, uh, the financial and the notoriety and all of that will always, for so many people, trump being authentic and honest and changing their heart and mind. And I think that's a disease that is uniquely Western and American. Um, but I've definitely shifted a lot of my work um, away from trying to change politicians and mega church pastors because they just, they're more interested in preserving wealth and money, unfortunately, most of them. Um, and I think that's a huge driving force to people's politics and uh, theology is if it is benefiting them economically, then there's no reason for them to shift. Right. Yeah. I mean, do you, this, this is just a, a personal thought in the middle of when you were talking there, do you ever get the feeling that like in the midst of, you know, gay marriage becoming legalized, which was just a few years ago. So in the midst of all that happening, I, it felt like at least in the, the culture's eye, there was a lot of kind of just giving in on the the side of the the sort of more religious right evangelicals of them saying okay like they won this like this is this is what it is there's there's a sort of um there's obviously pushback but there was also a lot of them where it was just like okay it's just the direction of the culture this is what it is so there was like that moment in 2015 or like the or so like within those few months where it seemed like okay we we got to here but then almost right after that and and in the midst of that like when you had other movements going on like black lives matter you had a lot of push from the progressive community to just keep going forward like we wanted to talk more about trans rights then we want to talk about more like you what you're starting to get into which we haven't really dived into too deeply about intersectional justice and how all this has become much more mainstream and it seems like the ball started to get rolling and now it's picked up a ton of momentum. And I'm just wondering, like, do you feel that part of like the disconnect with talking to mainstream evangelicals is because there's like a fear that we've now created the slippery slope and now it's just too far gone. Like when we start talking about trans rights and we start talking about intersectionality as a whole, like bringing these different um, minority groups and these different uh, works of, injust of justice and injustice together into the same conversations, does it? Do you think at all that it could be overwhelming? I guess maybe for like the average rural American who just saw that gay marriage was legalized on the television and now they're being, you know, sort of ask to keep pushing forward and they're not ready for it. This is just something I just thought of when you were talking there. Yeah, I think there's two answers to that question. I think one, um, the progressive movements, culture, political, religious, um, we, we were really naive. We are really naive in some ways. And the fact that, like you said, you start getting a few victories and then you just start going crazy. Um, not crazy as far as social positions, but like we start believing that progress is happening quicker than it is yeah. because in cities it feels like it is and on your social media silo it feels like it is and 
so then we create this world in our mind that's so progressive, and then we finally realize in an election, for instance, that, wow, we were really all delusional. Like, the progress that we thought happened didn't actually happen. Um, so I think there's, I'm going to speak in movement language here um, in particular, I think we need to slow down and pull back and say, change takes time. And even though our silos make us feel like it's happening, we're not actually focusing on the places where change really does need to happen if we are going to shift culture and if we're going to shift society. On the other hand, I don't think it's wrong. um, And I don't think we should hesitate to take things to their logical, logical conclusion, to jump down the slippery slope. In this book, that's one thing I say that I'm actually probably most proud of. It's like finally getting to the point where I say, yes, the slippery slope is real and you need to jump head first down it and let the spirit take you. Uh, so, and this will be very edgy, I'm sure. A couple, two months ago, um, some we did a question and answer series at our church and somebody submitted a question about polyamory um, being in a non-monogamous relationship or in a committed relationship with more than one person. And I think if we're going to look legally, socially, and theologically, um, that there are very healthy ways. I know um, throuples, I know people that have been in committed, long-term, multi-person relationships. And I think patriarchy, again, is the driving force of making us think that only two people can come together and form a family. And so I answered in front of my church. I said, I think polyamorous relationships can be blessed by God. I think they're healthy. I think they can be good. And I know that some of my progressive but more moderate friends heard me say that and were like, you're insane. You're going way too quick. You're going to hurt the LGBT Christian movement because you're jumping down this path. And my response to that kind of thinking is like, I mean, that's the whole point of intersectionality. You cannot wait. All of this is tied together. And so if we're not willing to say for the 0.1% of our population who might be biologically wired for a multiplicity in relationship, like if we're not willing to say that they should have equal rights in society and they should be protected like everyone else, then are we truly... uh, inclusive? Are we truly understanding intersectional identity? Are we truly understanding how different cultures assemble relationships differently? And we need to stop trying to colonize people and making them fit into a Western European idea of what a marriage or relationship looks like. Like, I do think we need to always be understanding that these are big, complex issues. They might make us uncomfortable. They might not make sense to us. But we need to liberate people to be who they are and give them equal rights in the process. And we can figure out the theology later, but it always comes with equality and dignity first. Um, So on that side of things, I'm like, let's just jump down the slope. And on the other side, let's be sure that we're not living in a siloed world. We're actually going and actually engaging in conversation, exposing people in middle America to different ways of seeing and being in the world. Well, it's interesting, even just from a legal perspective, when it comes to that, because I think one of the main, I think one of the main endpoints of uh, maybe caution or hesitation from people who claim the slippery slope problem is that one of the, the at least one of the main ones that I hear often is that it's all going to end in you know like adults uh, having sex with kids or animals yeah. or whatever it might be. And I think it's interesting that you bring up polyamory. Like I had my friend Jennifer on the podcast um, a few months ago, and she's in a polyamorous relationship. We talked a little bit about this, and I think from from a legal aspect like you would think like there is a libertarian position of like which which is obviously a more on the right side of the spectrum position which is just let people do what they want and leave the government out of it and like i think honestly like when it comes to adults consenting like that that is like a good it's a good place to leave a legal argument when it comes to this stuff because culturally like you're right to separate the sort of different boxes here where you have like your political your religious your other depending on how we uh we um determine and associate a lot of these different issues because when it comes to just the legal perspective like when it comes to 
adults having sexual relations or relationships with other consenting adults, I think that is a good uh, ending point to the slippery slope because obviously it can't go further into kids. It can't go into animals. There's You can't consent <laughs> if you're an animal. You can't consent if you're a kid. I mean, obviously there's some... I guess debate depending on the country, like especially in Europe, I don't like there's different consent ages, you know, is a, is a kid able to consent at 18, 16, 14? Like when is, when is that line drawn? Obviously that is an issue that has to get addressed, but it is, it's, it it is great. I think that you brought that up because I mean, it's, it is a super controversial thing in some circles, obviously, but it's important that if we do follow this trajectory of intersectional justice, like you do have to get, to the root and you have to follow it down because the further down you go, you find more of these hyper minority groups. Like it's not just uh, like on the surface, we see these different movements emerging and we address them as need be. You know, we address a movement like black lives matter. But then when you dig into that movement, you find all the subsets of it with different people and different minority statuses that need each of their own addressing of different issues, which I think is it's it's really important, and it's also totally where we lose the entire evangelical community and just in general the right side of the spectrum when talking about this stuff because it's just so much so fast, and it's like there's not a lot of great educational resources happening right now right. between parties that's really providing people what they need to understand and totally and that's i completely agree with you i think on one hand the argument for pedophilia and bestiality it's you're right that's where people go to it's a completely completely absurd argument in the sense that there's almost no culture in the world ever that has uh, legitimized that right. um, and i do think you're right there's going to be some interesting conversations i think in the near future we'll be having a national debate about lowering the age of consent to 16 i think um but the point here is and you keep highlighting it consent is the issue always at the end of the sexual conversation um respect consent mutuality is always what this comes down to and i do think we're going speaking completely socially and politically, to have to embrace a libertarian ideal. Um, I do think we're going to have to get to a place where if we're going to liberate people to be who they are, um, even if it's not something we agree with or understand, it means everyone should have equal rights. It doesn't matter what kind of relationship they have. And on the polyamory side of things, in the church right now, I'm not one to start writing polyamory theology because that's not my experience. But I do and will continue as a pastor to expose my people to polyamorous relationships that are healthy. So that Sunday, I put up a picture on the screen of the president of Metropolitan Community Churches. Her name's Rochelle Brown, and she's been in a decade-long committed polyamorous relationship, and they have two kids. And Here's a national religious leader who is in a healthy polyamorous relationship. And I think before we start arguing for these things, we need to be prepared to show people examples of real flesh and blood people because they can't even conceptualize what it means to be in an open relationship or polyamorous or whatever. Um, Yeah. So, and it's interesting, like when you even just think about divorce rates in our country too, like you wonder how much of that would be mitigated by polyamorous relationships because so many people are obviously feeling a need to have sex outside of their relationships or have some kind of physical emotional need met outside of the relationship and you wonder like how what is the number like i would love to know the actual number Obviously, I don't think we would ever have something as black and white as like a a perfect percentage. But I mean, it's interesting to think about like what percentage of people truly are made like biologically and environmentally as monogamous. And that's what they're designed for in that capacity versus someone who's designed to have more than one and and able to juggle that within their life. Because that's definitely I think for some people that are just straight and narrow as could be. They hear something like that and they're like, no way like that. That could never fly. Like I would be too insecure. That could like never work culturally on a mass scale. And you have all these different questions come up, but they're the type of questions that come up any time any kind of progressive movement emerges. Like these are just the kind of questions that 
we've always wrestled with when these big changes come about. So it's, and it's interesting too, when you mentioned in there, like, I think there's tons of subsets of issues, even just with power dynamics where like, Mm. depending on the consent age, like say consent age is lowered to 16 and then that becomes the new norm. So it's like, okay, between a 16 and an 18 year old, are they, if they're having sexual relations, like, is that bad? And it's like, okay, well, maybe that's a little bit more blurry. But then when you have a 16-year-old and a 50-year-old, you know, it's like it's the same type of deal as like a Harvey Weinstein situation where it's like, okay, maybe some of these women are old enough to consent, but they're in a power dynamic where this person has pretty much complete control over their future and their job. So it's obviously not an equal standing of consent like we would put in certain situations so it's really there are so many like nuances and complexities like when we look at each one of these things through a microscope it's so hard to to draw any kind of line yeah and that's as a pastor and as a somebody who does theology i come down on i always find myself referring to paul's writings in romans 14 i encourage everyone to read that passage and really wrestle with it because he says essentially what is moral and right for one person is not moral and right for another person. So stop judging one another and let God be the judge of however somebody lives out their ethics and morals. And I think not only in the church community, but in society, we need to get to a place where we, I mean, now I am going to sound like a complete libertarian, but (laughs) morality, especially around human relationships and sexuality, cannot be clearly defined. We're talking about the most complex beings on the earth, humans, and our relationships and our evolution, all of that is consistently changing and morphing and culture, culturally it's different depending on where you're at in the world. So it's just an absurd thought to think that you can create a law around how someone's relationship or sexuality could be expressed. Um, And I think we just need to Instead, promote, again, values, values like consent, values like mutual respect. Um, And I don't know if you can even legislate those things, but certainly from a church perspective, that's what I teach our congregation is I'm never going to tell you what a boundary line is except for the clear cases like pedophilia and bestiality. But what are the values that Christianity gives us? Love, joy, peace, patience. I always go back to the fruit of the spirit passage and say, if those are the values you're moving from, then allow your relationships and life and sexuality to manifest in whatever way it does. There's no judgment here. Just make sure that you're centering on these values. Um, And I think that works. I don't know. It's an experiment in our congregation. So I'll let you know in a year uh, how people's relationships look. But yeah, I think that's great too, because again, it's just, it's showing it's, it's similar um, way of looking at it, whereas like to to you growing into your identity and the issues that you were having where you weren't able to talk about your sexuality and then you were able to talk about it and how the people you were talking to, anyone who knows you sees that, you know, whatever, I guess to put it in your context, whatever fruits you're putting out there, you know, they're, they're good. So it's, it's interesting. I think that's the kind of definition i think a lot of people throw up when it comes to sin or living in the wrong or whatever it might be whereas it's anything that's going to separate you from god or from your path or from who you should be and i think for a lot of people like when when it comes down to some of these things like lgbtq like like um intersectionality they see the the movement as bad or they see the person's identity as bad but if they actually get to know the person or they get to know the people within the movement, you can see for yourself what fruit they're putting out there. And I think that's a really good way of measuring, you know, if something is true and if something is good and if it works. Because, you know, at the end of the day, if you're doing something harmful, obviously people are going to you're going to hurt people. You're going to hurt yourself. It's going to be visible all over the place. And I think that is the kind of the line that more of us should be drawing 
in some sense. But I mean, I'm interested to know, we can wind it down here a little, but when it comes to this whole topic of intersectionality, which is a big point of your book, when I, for a lot of people that I know who fall more on the right side of the political spectrum, when you start talking to them about a lot of these different movements within different identity groups, the, the topic of identity politics gets brought up a lot. And it's interesting where you have, uh, again, mass generalization here, but you have people more on the right sort of countering the, the idea of intersectionality by saying, you know, as, as a culture, we should be moving forward with more focus on the individual. Like we should be focusing more on each person and not on bigger groups. We should be focused more on uh, a person's identity and what they believe and what they think about things versus the color of their skin or their sexuality and all that. And then you have people on the left, you know, with what we're talking about here, saying that, you know, no, a lot of these people within these movements are disenfranchised and in need of propping up within our culture. So we have to talk about them as groups. So I'm interested sure. to know, like, when you are kind of introducing this topic to people, is there a way that you go about explaining it or describing it in almost like a 101 sense that can kind of explain away some of the maybe misconceptions that people have about it? Yeah. I mean, that's the most surprising thing to me. Um, and it might be because it might show how disconnected I am from the conservative world. But recently I, I wrote a bit um, about intersectionality in a different couple different places. And conservative evangelicals did respond in this very interesting way where the word intersectionality in that world has been so demonized. But it, what it shows me is that it's you clearly have misunderstood the term. No, I don't think you can disagree with intersectionality. It's not a, it's not a movement. It's not an ideology. It's a statement. It's an observation of how things actually are in the world. Um, and in the book, I give a really um, 101 kind of layout of what intersectionality is. And basically, the term comes from the case of a woman named Anita Hill, who, what, basically was filing a, uh, was suing her boss, who was a white man, and she is an African-American woman, um, for sexual assault. And it, her case became very public, and the women's movement stood up and said, we want to claim this as a case for women's rights. Mm -hmm. And then the African-American community stood up and said, no, this is about racial justice. This is a white man taking advantage of an African-American person. Um, and Anita Hill in the midst of this, kept saying, well, actually, no, both of these things are linked. Um, it's because I'm a black woman that this person thought that he could take advantage of me. Um, not just that I'm a woman, but my race played into this. Um, and in her story, the women's rights movement really won. Her race was downplayed in public discourse, and it, she became a symbol initially as a leader of the women's rights movement. She won her case um, and so people started looking at that, and one particular person, Kimberly, Kimberly Crenshaw Williams, coined the term intersectionality after looking at that case and saying, wow, there were multiple levels of oppression happening there, and you really can't accurately understand what happened to Anita Hill unless you understand that she was both black and a woman, and that played into the psyche of the person who was abusing her. Um, and like I said earlier, I think it's just really easy to understand that Let's remove the sexuality component altogether for a second and say, uh, obviously, in the American South, you are more oppressed in a racist community uh, as a black woman than you are as a black man. It's not a comparison thing. It's not an oppression Olympics type thing. It's simply a statement of reality that women in general are more oppressed than men. Black women are more oppressed than white women, and black women are more oppressed than white men. And so if you're going to liberate and stand for the justice of a black woman, you have to fight for both racial justice and gender justice. And again, that's just kind of a statement of reality. Um, if you are a poor white person, uh, you are in a more oppressive situation than a upper class white person. Um, you just need to understand the ways that systemic injustice is working in the society. And then 
from that point, you can begin to actually work for equality and justice in the world by addressing all of the mechanisms of oppression. So, um, again, most people in intersectional circles would say the most oppressed person in our society today is the transgender woman of color. This is somebody who, in almost every aspect of their life, is being pushed against by society and discriminated against. And so if we're going to seek liberation for them, we can't just focus on transgender justice. We can't just focus on uh, racial equity. We can't just focus on gender justice. We have to address all of those things in order for that trans woman of color to have an equal, just experience in the world. Um, and again, it is a very, on one level, a rethrow philosophical analysis of how oppression works. But for so many people, especially oppressed people, it is their lived experience. And I think that's, again, intersectionality is best understood when you listen to somebody who is oppressed in multiple ways and you understand um, how all of their different identities cause them to be disadvantaged. Yeah, and you used a term in there, the oppression Olympics term, which is one that I hear in more right-leaning circles pretty frequently because, and I, I think, like, the example you used where you have, like, a black uh, black um, transgender woman and how that, like, there's different levels where, like, that would be, like, obviously from every angle of culture, that person has been pushing back against some level of oppression. And it's interesting because I think, like, People uh, who d don't relate or just aren't familiar at all with this language or these types of uh, conversations, they tend to throw up a lot of anecdotes. And like I, I hear this a lot with people I talk to where like I have black friends or um, like like Hispanic friends who will talk about issues like this and say like, well, I've never felt that. Like I've never felt oppressed. Like I've never felt like someone's like said this to me and like with racist undertones. And I think you see a lot of this on the right side of the spectrum where people like, like one of the most recent ones, what is her name? Uh, that girl, uh, she's like one of the most recent right wing uh, talking heads. Her name is uh, Candace Owens. Do you okay. know who Candace Owens is? A little bit, yeah. yeah. She's one of these people who, um, like, she, I think she said her story is as of, like, two years ago, she was liberal or identifying as Democrat in some, some capacity of those, those circles. And she was a black, I, I don't know if she was an activist or she was involved in something politically. And anyway, she had this situation befall her. And it, it was like a legal thing. And then she came out of the situation in her words, you know, eyes open. I can't believe I was blind to all this. And now she's like a right wing uh, talking head type of figure. And she goes on these shows and debates people and says, like, racism doesn't exist and all this stuff. And it's just really interesting because, like, you get a lot of these types of figures that get propped up because people are looking for, like, the exception, I guess, and not the rule, which is so, I, a, to someone like maybe you or I, it's so apparent in yeah. these situations. But I think to the general public, like, especially on the right-leaning end of the spectrum, it becomes really hard to navigate who's telling the truth and, and, these, and these figures really blur the lines. Because obviously, like, when you go through... A, a entire grouping of people like whether it's a race or a gender or you know a combination of the of the two or or more you're going to get like large numbers medium numbers small numbers minuscule numbers and within each of those categories you're going to have outliers who aren't affected at all or aren't affected as much as other like the the, the majority of that group so it becomes this yeah. really weird game where we're kind of playing probability you know it's like we're talking in terms of a group but like obviously it should go without having to be said that we don't mean literally everybody within this group because like yeah. you have right-wing trans uh political commentators like you have like blair white is a big one yeah. on youtube and she's you know a, a trans woman and it's like you, you have people within each of these subgroups who don't fit the mold but we're talking about just general uh, groups like we're not talking about these outliers and that's a really i think difficult 
point to be made that gets blurred a lot when these sort of anecdotal figures become popularized in media to kind of to, to make the yeah. entire thing more confusing. Yeah, and with that, an unpopular opinion that I am becoming a little bit more brave enough to say is that I, the right does have some really good, legitimate critiques of what's happening or what has happened. I think there's change occurring in the progressive side of things. Um, one of my mentors is a guy named Ken Wilbur, and he talks about um, what he calls mean green, which is uh, postmodern progressives that go to the extreme and they become really vitriolic. It's not yeah. even activism. It's policing of language. I mean, that's why people like Jordan Peterson become popular in this moment. I don't agree with him completely, but I think there is something to be said. When the left gets so crazy that there's no grace for people who don't know how to use right language or don't know what different words mean, and it does become oppression Olympics, so you have to do a power analysis before you can have any sort of meeting at all. Like, there is an extreme version of that that I do think we need to say, wait a second, that if we keep going down that identity politics path to its furthest, most extreme uh, incarnation, we create a, a world that's almost impossible to exist in. Yeah, it's like because, a civil war type of situation. Yeah, and you can't use language anymore, frankly, because all it's just hard. Um, most people that I know that are actually the most oppressed people, for instance, we've had a lot of conversations with trans members of our community, and they're often the most gracious. They're like, it's fine if you mess up or don't understand my pronouns. Let's talk about it. Let's work on it. Mm. That's not everyone. But a lot of people are really gracious as we're changing and moving in society. And we need, again, it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier, like the change hasn't been as quick as some people perceive it has. And we need to remember that if we don't do a careful job of re-educating people and um, having grace and growing slowly, then the change is going to be flimsy. It's not going to last. Um, and the last thing I'll say on that is, much of what we're experiencing today is just a rebirth of what was already going on in the 60s, the conversations around yep. gender, sexuality, and race, and what happened there. People, the movement happened so quickly, everyone thought it was fixed, at least in the privileged uh, classes of society. And here we are, I mean, a few uh, generations later, and we're realizing, oh, wow, these we didn't lay a framework that changed society. We changed the top level of society on the top level of this certain cultural group and the issue still festered. And so if we're going to do this well, if culture is going to change, grace, um, measured progress is going to be the way that it's going to happen. That's such a great point. And I, I really do. I agree with you on all that. I mean, it, it does seem like there is this portion of those on the left who have now become this new this new gatekeeper community and it's it's just all it does is creating more of the same you know it's creating boundaries where there doesn't need to be boundaries you know creates language policing where there should be education and like you mentioned you know with the the trans people in your community who are much more gracious of those who might not understand or have the vocabulary to interact with them like that the intent matters you know like there's yeah. there's definitely a line of intent that people see and i think on the internet that it's just completely lost in just text you know you don't have people's body language you don't have any anything in person you don't have their history like all you have all you have is blank text and it's it can be interpreted so many different ways it's really hard to measure someone's intent you know and like when you're in person, you can almost tell right away if someone has bad intentions, if they're being angry or if they're being sort of malicious, you know, under, underlying with whatever they're saying. And that is such a key in moving forward that I think the Internet is really pushing us backwards a little bit because you have yeah. a lot of people who could be potentially open to these changes and open to be educated and they might misstep and they get shouted down or they get like mobbed. And then they're completely disenfranchised and they don't want anything to do with the movement. <clears throat> and then yeah. it's like impossible to re-engage them in the future. Yeah. And it's just, it really is, it's just a, a tricky space. Is, I love talking about this because it's just where we are as a culture and people 
I think don't realize how much it's affecting. It is like a, you sort of alluded to this, but it is like a trickle down effect. Like just like in the sixties, we had all these counterculture movements happening and then people expected it to sort of just trickle down to everybody years later. Like we have something similar happening now where people are on social media you know, at, enacting the progressive ideals in these more or less echo chambers, whether they're chambers within uh, different media publications or online communities. And there's this expectation that that is just trickling down to the rural parts of America. And it's just really not at all. I mean, it's just taken much more time than I think people are realizing. <laughs> yeah, totally. I'm yep. with you. So with all that said, I mean, we can we can end with this here. I mean, I just want to know, do you have anything on your mind that we haven't covered here that like you wish more people were talking about or like that you wish you got asked more about like within any of these subjects? I know we kind of jumped all over the place, but, uh, you know, no, I think, again, um, just engaging and understanding I think we all just need to be mindful of the big systems of exclusion that are at work in our society. And we need to, the thing that I don't think most people talk about that I touch on gently in the book is um, all of this begins on the internal level. It all begins with, um, I quote the great theologian RuPaul in the book and say, um, she has this famous quote, uh, how the hell are you supposed to love anyone else if you can't even love yourself? Like, until we actually begin at the personal psychological level and start understanding our own pain and um, our own wounds and our own um, experiential conditioning, uh, it's going to be hard to do any good work for justice or inclusion in the world. And so at the end of all these conversations, I really want to focus and push people to say, do the work on yourself first. Yeah. Uh, be, begin looking at self-inclusion. Can you love all the weird parts of you? Um, can you get over your cultural conditioning and express yourself authentically? And if not, why not? Um, if you start there, you're going to be a much healthier activist and advocate and ally down the road for inclusion of all sorts of different kinds of people. I love it, man. Thanks so much again for uh, doing this and sharing all that about your story. I mean, so much of it's just insane to me. And it's really, it's really encouraging to be able to talk to someone who is so active in this work and is also so thoughtful in your approach and how this is being perceived and how the effect of what you're doing is is really changing the scope of our entire culture, not just the the one segment that, you know, we, we've been kind of circling around here, which is really great. Um, I appreciate it. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll have all of your, um, like your book of the True Inclusion in the uh, show notes in the intro i'll make sure we link all that stuff Uh, is there anything else you wanted to hit i think that's good i really appreciate the conversation the way that you directed it it was a good one (laughs) (laughs) that that makes me feel better because i'm super new at this and i know you're you've been podcasting since you were like 15 so (laughs) (laughs) it's a hard thing to do and good on you it's a lot of work it is a lot of work i I appreciate it i I really appreciate the time man Totally. It was so good to talk to you, and I hope we can chat again soon. Yeah, for sure. All right, take care.